everybody hear my voice? Yes, you sound good. Is my voice coming across yes, well? Sounds great. Yep, okay. sound good. All right, excellent. Um, so, um, you know, it's an absolute pleasure and honor for me uh, to have an opportunity to talk to this group uh, that Steve has organized. And uh, the first thing I should do is to thank everybody for choosing to come here instead of being at the Super Bowl. Um, Steve called it the Super Bowl of Astronomy. I don't know whether I would use that term, uh, but I have to say uh, that the launch of the James Webb Telescope is indeed a big deal. It is a game changer. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so before we get into the science and technology, which we'll be spending most of our time on, I wanted to start today's talk by showing you a one and a half minute video, which shows the unfolding of the telescope that happened over this last month, all in deep space. And while you watch this video, I want, to I want you to suspend your science and technology brain for a few minutes. Uh, get into your right brain instead of your left brain, if you will, because I want you to appreciate not just the science, but also the beauty of this amazing instrument. So while you watch this little video, think, uh, think about the what the telescope really represents. Appreciate some of the beauty of the instrument. You might even think of it as a flower opening up its petals or a creature waking up to stretch its arms and open its eyes to the deep dark cosmos which it is designed to explore. Um, think also of the audacity, the grit and the vision of the people that made this telescope possible. Think about the 25 years of blood, sweat, and tears of thousands of scientists and engineers that went into building it. Three space agencies, 20 countries, and 258 private companies and academic institutions contributed to Webb's construction. Think then of the unity that it represents, especially in the extremely divisive world that we live in today. I also want you to reflect on the triumph that this instrument represents for all of mankind, and also the confidence that it will give us to be even more ambitious in the future. So with that, let me show you the video. Um, give me one second here. Share my screen. So. Okay, hopefully everybody can see it. And if you don't hear the sound, please let me know. There's just some musical background that you will hear. Uh, wait, I think this may be the wrong one. Just give me one second. Stop sharing here. Just a second. Sharing can always be a little tricky. Um, share my screen. I can play some. I have it here no, as well. No, no I, I have it. Uh, just okay. one second here. Um, okay, hopefully this will work. Yes. All right, here we go. Just relax, sit on your seats and just watch this.
So the sequence that you just watched happened over the course of 13 days, but it was shrunk into one and a half minutes so that you could see the whole thing. Um, let me now move to sharing my slides with you. So share screens. Okay, hopefully you can see that. And there we go, trying to make this full screen. Okay, here we are. So, um, if watching that video evoked a certain amount of uh, emotion inside you, you're not alone. Even NASA decided to commission an artist to make a series of watercolors uh, on the James Webb telescope to depict what that artist saw in it. And um, here is one of the art pieces uh, that was created by Joanna Barnum, who's a watercolor artist. If you look carefully, you will see that in this picture, there's a chrysalis that is turning into a butterfly. So that was the, uh, the impression that the artist wanted to give. And I just wanted to take off a little bit on this painting to tell you that this connection with biology um, that this artist is thinking about is actually more than a metaphor. Because if you really think about it, our eyes have evolved biologically over millions of years to see more sharply in more colors. So now what's happening is that instead of using gene mutation as a way to evolve our eyes, what is happening is that our collective brains are helping improve our collective vision as a result of these new instruments. So you might even think about this as our multicellular organism, which is what we are, is slowly transforming into what we could think about as a multi-brain organism. And as a matter of fact, another painting from the same artist kind of depicts the same idea. The James Webb Telescope is our collective eye into the cosmos. So for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna tell you um, a little bit about the James Webb Telescope and why it is such a big deal and why we are so excited about the possible science that it might uncover once it gets going, which will happen in about another four or five months from, from now. So first of all, the James Webb Telescope is an infrared telescope. Now, what does that mean? I think most of you know that the electromagnetic spectrum is a very wide ranging spectrum out of which only a very tiny sliver constitutes visible light. And it's a testimony to the diversity of and the richness of our universe that our universe radiates not just invisible light that we can see with our eyes, but it radiates in pretty much every wavelength of this electromagnetic spectrum. And in every wavelength, there are new things that we can uh, discover about our cosmos. So the instruments that we build are basically designed to cover certain parts of the spectrum where we expect to see uh, the things that can be shown through that part of the spectrum. And the James Webb Telescope picked the infrared. In fact, there is a part of the infrared that it works in. And the reason that it picked that part of the spectrum is because this is where some of the most elusive questions that we have about our cosmos are waiting to be discovered. So here is another picture of that spectrum, and it shows where the web fits in. And it is a comparison also between the web and a couple of other telescopes, one being Hubble, which I'm sure you all know about, and the other one Spitzer, which is a predecessor of the Webb telescope, which was also an infrared telescope. 
So you can see that there is this spot that Web has chosen. You can think of it as a sweet spot because this is where we are hoping that we can uncover some of the deepest mysteries that our cosmos has to, um, to give to us. Now, the very first thing I want to tell you is that why is James Webb Telescope a space telescope? Well, the reason is that in the, in the infrared part of the spectrum, most of that radiation is absorbed by atmospheric gases. So having an infrared telescope on the Earth doesn't do us much good at all. The only way that we can really look into the infrared is by having something that is way above our atmosphere. In the beginning, that was done with rockets and balloons, and now we have the technology to spend, send these telescopes out into space where there will be no interference for it to do what it needs to do. So let me tell you a little bit more about why infrared is the place that we wanted the James Webb Telescope to be. By the way, I'm going to be using these terms interchangeably, James Webb Telescope, Webb Telescope, JWST. I'm referring to basically the same thing that we're talking about today. So there are two big reasons why infrared is so important for a telescope to use. The first one is that it's a very penetrating form of radiation. It does not get stopped by things that will generally stop light like dust, like clouds, like particles, haze, and so forth. Uh, infrared light goes right through it. And in this little picture, you can see that even if you put your hand underneath this dark plastic, if you take an infrared picture of it, you will be able to see everything inside that dark plastic. And this is very easy to see and appreciate how, how important it is. On this slide, I show you two pictures. <clears throat> the first one on the left-hand side was taken by Hubble, and on the right-hand side was taken by the previous infrared telescope. And you can see the difference. In the second picture, you can see lots of stars that were hiding behind the clouds in the first picture. And to be able to see these stars is what we really want because this is where a lot of the secretive and interesting physics is happening that we want to uncover. Here is yet another picture of the same kind of thing, Carina Nebula, and you can see in the infrared picture, you see so much more than what you can see with the visible light picture. Now, the second reason why infrared is so important for the Webb Telescope is because the light from the beginning of our universe which is very early on when galaxies and stars were just forming, that light has actually expanded as a result of the expansion of the universe. And as a result, the wavelength has been stretched out. So the light that started out in the visible spectrum far, far long ago is now infrared light. And so the only way to be able to see the stars and galaxies right from the beginning of the universe is to be able to detect uh, infrared. Okay, um, so now let's go into the challenges of building an infrared telescope. It's not as easy as building a visible telescope like the Hubble. And so the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is what we call the sun shield of the, uh, of the JWST. So let's see why we need a sun shield and that such a huge sun shield. So first of all, Hubble, which is a visible light telescope, doesn't have to worry about many things because light is simply reflected from a surface. And therefore, as long as you point the, the, uh, the Hubble telescope towards a dark part of the sky, it will only see what is coming inside it from that part of the sky. And so, you know, having a tube like the one that you see here just works perfectly. This doesn't work for an infrared telescope. The reason is that infrared light doesn't just reflect from a surface, it gets absorbed by the surface. Basically, infrared light is the light that you get from your fireplace. It's the heat that is coming. And 
as a object gets warmed up, it will continue to radiate in infrared for a long period of time before it cools again. And so just one exposure to a source of warmth of infrared radiation will essentially make the telescope useless for many, many days. So the only way to get around that is to shield it from all sources of warmth that it can possibly be impacted by. Well, in the area that we are in, in the universe, there are three sources of warmth that can affect the telescope. Of course, the biggest one is the sun, but it turns out that even the moon and the earth have the warmth and therefore they radiate infrared, not as much as the sun, but enough to become a huge noise source for the James Webb Telescope. So we've got to have a way to shade the telescope, not just from the sun, but from all of these three objects. How do you do that? Well, the first thing that people did in the beginning when they were using infrared telescopes and putting them into space is that they would immerse the whole telescope, including the mirror of the telescope in a very low temperature liquid, like liquid helium, and that would keep the temperature to a very, very low point so that whatever instruments and stuff is there is always maintained at that temperature and therefore it does not become a source of noise for the infrared detector that is trying to take pictures in infrared. But as the size of the mirrors that we use for the, these telescopes started to grow in size, that became impractical. So what happened at that time is that people figured out a way in which they could use radiation itself as a way to cool the mirror and the instruments of the telescope as long as it is protected from the sources of heat, which are the three objects that we talked about. And this is where we come to the sun shield that was created for the James Webb Telescope, which is going to protect it from all of these sources of radiation all of the time. And we will see how that can be possible. But first of all, let me tell you about this five layered sun shield. It's you can see from the size of the men and women that are standing around as to what size this shield is. It's about 70 feet in length, which is the size of a tennis court. It is made up of very thin material like mylar, 0 0.001 inches thick. That's like the thickness of a human hair. And it is coated with a very thin layer of aluminum, which gives it the reflective power that is absolutely necessary for it. It also has some special bonding done to it so that in case there is a small hole that is made in the shield as a result of some kind of a meteorite going through it, that that hole will not tear the whole sheet. It will continue to be a very tiny hole, which can be managed. But if it tore the shield, then we would be in really big trouble. And the only way to take a shield like that up into space is to fold it and put it into the rocket and then send it off, which is exactly what happened. And it was held together by 170 or so pins that held it in there. Um, now, it does an amazing job of keeping the heat away from the telescope. Each of the five layers is designed so that about 90% of the heat that comes on one side doesn't make it to the other. And this happens because all of the radiation that comes on the other side gets reflected and then goes out from the side. And so by the time you get to the fifth shield, you have essentially absorbed all of that heat. It turns out a very few milliwatts of heat is all that, that you can see on the other side. If you think about this as a sun tanning lotion to stop the sun, the SPF value of it would be more than a million. You know, the, the typical suntan lotion that you use is about 20 or 30 or something like that. So this is how powerful uh, this shield is. And you can see what an effect it has. These are the two sides of the sun shield. On the hot side, because the sun is shining on it, the temperature can go as high as 185 degrees Fahrenheit. On the right side, the cold side, you have minus 388. So there's a 600 Fahrenheit difference between the two sides of, um, of, the, of the shield. 
that's how well um, it works. Okay, so great to have this shield, but now you have to solve another problem. You have to make sure that this shield can protect you from the sun, moon, and the earth all at the same time, which means that you have to put the telescope in a place where all three of these objects can always remain on, you know, aligned on, on a different side of the, the shield from which, which you're protecting. So that takes a lot of thinking and figuring out as to how to make it possible. And that's the reason why the James Webb Telescope is parked in the place that it is parked at today, which I'll talk a little bit about today, which is called the Lagrange point, Lagrange point number two, as it turns out. So first thing you have to do is to keep the telescope in such a way that it goes around the sun along with the earth. So therefore, at least the sun and the earth will always be on the same side of the telescope. But that's not sufficient because you also have to worry about the moon. But if you keep it far enough away so that the orbit of the moon does not make a big angle with the telescope, then it's possible to keep all three of them in the same direction. And that's exactly what happens. It turns out that there are only five points close to the orbit of the earth that have the ability to be synchronized with the Earth's orbit without having to use any extra fuel to do it. The sun's gravity does the job automatically. And it turns out that one of these five points, the Grange points they're called, happens to be away from the Earth about a million miles. And that distance is, is what you need to keep the sun, moon, and the Earth all in the same direction so that you can shield the telescope from them. Now, this is all well and good, but it has, there is, a, there is a price to pay for it. And the price is that the Webb telescope being a million miles away from the earth will never be able to be serviced. And that is quite a big deal because if you remember or know, the uh, Hubble telescope was serviced five times. And it was because of its servicing that we are able to see pictures from the Hubble even today, 30 years after its launch. That will not be possible with the web, so it has to work perfectly. And so far, it certainly is, and we have to keep our fingers crossed. Now, one other interesting thing here is that if you put it on exactly on the Lagrange point, then it turns out that because it's aligned with the sun and the earth, the shadow of the earth would fall on the telescope. And that means its solar cells, which are critical for the operation of its computers, will not be able to generate energy. So what happens is we put a small halo orbit around L2, and with that halo orbit, we can keep it exposed to the sun in order to get the batteries on the other side of the shield, while on the shaded side of the shield, the mirror can do its job of taking the pictures that it needs to take. Now, it does mean, though, that because it has to be maintained in this orbit, which it can sometimes drift from, you need a little bit of fuel to do that. And this, it turns out, will be the bottleneck that will decide how long the James Webb telescope can continue to function. Because if this fuel is exhausted, then uh, the telescope will no longer be able to maintain its orbit uh, in a consistent way. Let's talk now a little bit about the mirror. So the mirror has to be such that it has the maximum sensitivity and the maximum um, ability to catch as much of the light or the radiation, the infrared radiation that it can. And one thing improves resolution, which is, you know, the size of the mirror itself decides what the resolution will be, which means how, how finely it can separate small things that are close to each other. And the sensitivity is decided by the amount of light that can come into the telescope. And in this slide, you can see it makes a very big difference. You can see lowest, lowest, less resolution and high resolution pictures and low sensitivity and high sensitivity pictures. If you have high sensitivity, you can see way more faint objects. So this is what the mirror of the James Webb telescope looks like. You can compare it with um, Hubble's um, uh, mirror, which is uh, much smaller. And the interesting thing that you notice is that it's made out of 18 hexagons. 
these hexagons are individual mirrors and they will combine together to make a single mirror so that we can get the size that we need uh, to do the, the things that the James Webb Telescope has to do. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea about the sensitivity of this instrument, this will boggle your mind. Um, if there was a bumblebee that was at the distance of how far the moon is from the Earth, this telescope is so sensitive that it will be able to detect the warmth of that bumblebee. And that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. Of course, it'll do that only if there's nothing, there's no moon around because, you know, it has to be completely dark other than the bumblebee. So not only did, uh, the, is, the, is the mirror made out of segments, but it's also foldable so that it can fit inside the fairing of the rocket in which it was sent along with the sun shield. It's made up of special, made up of a very rare metal called beryllium, because beryllium is strong, it's lightweight, and also it has a very nice feature that when it when it becomes cold, it becomes very stable. It doesn't expand or contract, even if there is a few degrees of difference in temperature. This beryllium was then coated with a very thin layer of pure gold, less than 100 atoms thick, in order to give it the reflectivity that you need from the mirror. And in order for it to be aligned, it is controlled by a total of 126 micromotors, which you can call actuators. There are actually seven motors on each of this, each of the mirrors, one on each of the corners, and then one in the middle. And those motors can change the shape of the mirror to an amazing precision five nanometers, if you don't know what nanometers are, it turns out it's one ten thousandth of the thickness of a hair. That's the amount of motion that you can have with these things and you can make adjustments and alignments accordingly. And this folks is what is happening right now. You may have heard those who have been keeping tab on the James Webb Telescope. In the last week, we did an amazing thing. We were able to first of all show that light can actually go inside the cameras of the, um, of the James Tele Webb Telescope. And, and it took its first picture of a star. The star was picked because it's, it's a bright star and it is nothing around it. And these are 18 pictures taken by the 18 segments of the telescope. Now, the reason that they're all scattered around is because those segments are not aligned yet. And so, over the next three months, these actuators, these motors that I talked about are going to make tiny adjustments one after the other because you can't have them do it all at the same time. And the rate at which these adjustments are made is so slow, it is comparable to the rate of growth of grass. That's how slow it is. And so these adjustments will take three months to do, but at the end of it, you will see one sharp image of the star in the center. And that will mean that all of these segments are working together as a single mirror and the web telescope will be ready to take its pictures and do its job after that. And this is just another picture that connects all of these stars with the individual segments from which they came from. And finally, <clears throat> to close this part, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the instrumentation of the web telescope. Um, it has basically two sets of cameras, one for the mid-infrared and one for the near-infrared. And it turns out the mid-infrared detector has to be maintained at even a lower temperature than what is possible to create with the radiative cooling that is used. Basically what happens is when you stop any heat from coming onto the instrumentation in the mirror, they gradually radiate all of their heat into space until they come to a very, very low temperature. That's minus 447 degrees is what you need for the mid infrared. And that it turns out is done with a cryostat. So, you know, you need at least one cryostat for that in addition to the radiative cooling. All right, so let's move on to the science. What are the big questions that this telescope is going to be able to answer for us? So um, I've picked four areas to talk about. It turns out that there are many, many things that this telescope will be able to do, uh, but I'm gonna focus on these ones because to me, they were the most exciting things that we would want to know. 
So the so I'll go through these areas. It's um, you know we'll be able to see things with first start and galaxies. We'll be able to test the standard model of the cosmology, and we'll be able to do a lot with star and planet formation and atmospheres, which is one of the most interesting things. All right, so the first thing to understand, which many of you probably already do, that when you look far away with a telescope, you're not just going far in distance, you're also looking back in time. And that simply has to do with the fact that light has a finite speed. And therefore, the light that you see coming from something that is far away, which has taken a long time to get to you, is light that started a long time ago. And that way, you can actually see what's going on in the universe long ago. So this is a very convenient thing because with most other things, you have to look for artifacts and fossils to figure out what happened in the past. Well, in the universe, you don't have to do that. You just take a telescope, which is like a time machine, and you see with your own eyes what happened millions and sometimes billions of years ago. And so the difference between uh, Webb and the and the Hubble telescope is that the Hubble was good enough to be able to look what happened in the universe 400 million years after the Big Bang, while the James Webb telescope will be able to see much further away and will be able to see what happened only 100 million years after the Big Bang, which is actually a key era because it was then that stars and galaxies were starting to form. And we really want to understand how that happened. So this is now a, a different way of looking at it, but it's basically the same kind of picture. And it shows that the further away you go, the more deep in the past you are being able to look. Now, Hubble revolutionized our understanding of galaxy formation already. It showed us that early in the universe, galaxies did not look anything like what they look today. They were very irregularly shaped, which told us that they were still evolving. They hadn't yet quite been there, but it didn't quite tell us how they got to that place where Hubble was able to detect them. And that missing piece is what the James Webb Telescope will allow us to do. So what are some of the things that we can um, kind of wait excitedly to, to, uh, for the James Webb Telescope to reveal? Well, we, we really don't know how the first stars were formed. When you have pure hydrogen and helium, it's a very different environment for star formation than the one that we have now, where there's a lot of heavy elements that have been created as a result of older stars dying and spewing out all of this material into the galaxy. From pure hydrogen and helium, the physics of star making is very different. And we don't quite understand. We think that these stars will be much bigger in size and that they would uh, die much quicker. Um, but to understand exactly how that happened is something that the Webb telescope will help us do. We also have this big mystery that all galaxies have supermassive black holes in their centers. And if we look as far away as the Hubble was able to look, we still find these supermassive black holes. And it's a big mystery in terms of how were they formed so quickly after the universe started? And what role did they play in the formation of galaxies? We think it's a very important role, but we don't really understand. And we don't even quite know how they, they were formed so quickly. All right, so that's, we, we are hoping to learn a lot about the beginning of the universe and how it started. <clears throat> there is one other deep mystery that has been created in, in the last um, 10 years or so, which we are hoping the James Webb Telescope will be able to solve. And that is a mystery that is not called the Hubble tension. Now, what is that? It turns out that the Hubble constant is a very important number for the universe. In fact, people say it's the most important number. And the Hubble constant, it tells us the rate at which the universe is expanding today. And one of the things that the Hubble was designed, the Hubble telescope was designed to do, was to measure the Hubble constant so that we could figure out how fast our universe is expanding and therefore figure out the age of the universe before Hubble the rough age of the universe was only known to about 100% error, which was like anywhere between 10 to 20 billion years. 
Hubble was able to make a huge dent into that. It was able to look at many more galaxies further away and was able to figure out how fast they were receding from us, which is the calculation that goes into calculating the Hubble constant. So the Hubble telescope was able to eventually tell us that our universe is about 14 billion years old. Now, beyond that, there was a huge surprise that happened um, in, the, in the late 1990s, where we discovered that our universe was not only expanding, but the rate at which it was expanding was actually increasing, which was a, which was a big surprise because we expected it, the expansion to slow down. Now, it turned out that the way to measure that acceleration is to look at something called type 1a supernova. A supernova is the explosion of a star when it dies. And these special supernovas are, um, are able to tell us exactly how far a galaxy is because they have these things called light curves, which basically tell how light um, you know, fades away after the explosion happens. And and again, Hubble was able to use that to even further refine the age of the universe to within about 2% or so. So um, now it turns out that we can also use the microwave background radiation. You know, the stuff that Steve told you earlier on was detected just a few miles from where I live. This microwave background radiation actually tells us a lot about the early universe. It tells us the size of the features of that universe, how big the clumps were that would eventually become galaxies a billion years, you know, hundreds of millions years later. And it turns out that you can use the size of these features to actually calculate the age of the universe using the beginning of the universe rather than the the current universe, right? And so now we have two ways of calculating the expansion and therefore calculating the age of the universe. And over these last 10 years, we have found that there is a discrepancy. There is almost a 10% discrepancy in the age of the universe that you get by using the microwave background versus the age of the universe that you get by simply looking at how fast the galaxies are receding. In order to solve this mystery, the Webb telescope will need to figure out what is the rate at which the galaxy is receding in between, not how they are receding now, but and not how they were you know, receding very, very early, but in between. And that is the part that we need to resolve this big mystery. So that is something that you know, I'm sure a lot of people who are working on this are very, very excited to happen. Okay, um, let me tell you about the other couple of topics. First off is exoplanets. So not only will Webb tell us about how we originated, how the first stars were formed, which after all was the beginning of the evolution of, um, of the universe, but it will also tell us something about the beginning of life. And that is because it will be able to look at exoplanets. Exoplanets is a short term for extrasolar planets, which means planets that are outside of our solar system. You, some of the previous telescopes like Kepler have already told us that we have lots of exoplanets everywhere. In fact, we believe that every star has at least one exoplanet and possibly more than one going around it. However, there are still lots of mysteries that remain about these exoplanets and whether or not they can sustain life. What is the possibility that they can sustain life? What kind of atmospheres do they have? And that is what the Webb Telescope is really perfectly um, you know, designed to be able to, uh, to probe. Um, so we really want to know whether our solar system is special or whether you know, there's, it, it's very typical of how all the other solar systems are like. Well, for one, we know that already looking at the distribution of the kinds of planets that we have uh, in, in our galaxy, um, that there are many different kinds of planets that we don't see in our solar system. In fact, one kind that is specifically of interest to us are called sub-Neptunes. These are planets that are um, in between the size of the Earth and the size of Neptune. 
We don't have anything like that. We have Earth, and then we have Neptune and Uranus, which are about four times the mass of the Earth. And then we have Jupiter and Saturn, which are about 10 times the mass of the Earth. But we really don't have a planet that is twice or two and a half times the size of the Earth. It turns out that when we look to the exoplanets, that kind of planet is the most frequently encountered planet in the galaxy. And so if there is life in the galaxy, it behooves us to understand, can these kinds of planets sustain life or not? Because if they can, then the possibility that there is life on in our galaxy will certainly become much, much more. So one thing that Hubble has given us is that it has allowed us to look at new, brand new stars that are forming in our galaxy. If we look at what are called uh, star nurseries, which are basically clouds of gas in which stars are being formed. Um, Hubble was able to see at least a few of these new forming stars with galactic, with, uh, with planetary disks around them. And those are the disks of dust from which the planets are formed. So it was able to tell us about these things, but it doesn't have the ability to penetrate these clouds in order for us to see what's going on inside. What are the chemicals that are coming together to make these planets? Do those chemicals have organic compounds in them that could possibly be the precursors of life? Are those compounds able to then sustain um, you know, the possibility of life growing on that planet? So those are the questions that we are really, really hoping that the Hubble uh, will enable us to answer because the Hubble can go right into these clouds, it can create spectroscopes, and these spectroscopes are the fingerprints of all the chemicals that are going on, that are, you know, that the gas clouds are being composed of, and from which planets are being formed. Um, so it, the web will also be able to investigate a mystery that has been opened up by our exoplanet search, and that is we find that there are many planets that were formed far away from their stars, but somehow were able to migrate closer to their stars. We sometimes call them hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-like planets that are going around their stars at a distance which is one-tenth the distance of Mercury, which is the closest um, planet to our star, the Sun. And this is a mystery that you know, once we get into these protoplanetary disks and are able to look exactly how planet formation is happening, uh, we will be able to throw some light on that too. And the last thing that I want to tell you about the science is the fact that Webb will allow us to not only look at exoplanets, it will allow us to study the atmospheres of these exoplanets. The way this happens is that when a planet goes across its star, the star light from that planet goes through the atmosphere and then comes to the web, the infrared light. And in that infrared light are hidden the fingerprints of the chemicals that are in the atmosphere. Therefore, uh, we will be able to find what kinds of atmospheres exist, how many planets have atmospheres. We don't even know that. We have no idea right now what fraction of planets have atmospheres that could sustain life. And so we will be able to find the composition, the temperature of those atmospheres. And from there, we'll be able to make some conclusions as to what the chance is that there might be life there. Now, these conclusions are not 100%. You can't absolutely know for sure whether there is life, but the signatures of life are very, very strong. If, for example, an alien looked at Earth and was able to study our atmosphere and find out how much oxygen it has and, and, and the trace methane that it has, they could almost be sure that there was life on Earth uh, because some of these uh, compounds are can only be sustained in an atmosphere if there is respiration photosynthesis going on and, and organic decay going on on that planet. And so finding out these atmospheres is going to be a key to figuring out what the chance is of life uh, to be present in these planets. So I'm going to stop here so that there is some time for questions. And I'm going to uh, end with a little quote that I just recently actually got from a, um, an astrobiologist uh, when she was asked the question, why do we spend so much money to send things like, you know, James Webb telescope up into the sky? What are we getting from all of this? And she had a beautiful answer that I would like to share with you. Um, she said, every time we look outwards, and we push the frontiers, we always end up turning inwards as well. 
when we found out find out how what it takes for life to start when we find out how precious our life is when we find out how amazing our planet is compared to all the other planets that we see we will have a new appreciation of what we have and what we need to protect and and we would need to therefore think about what we need to do within our own humanity within our own planet to make it happen so i will stop here thank you and we do have i hope some time for uh, questions all right thank you so much thank you so much Ramit. my pleasure we'll start with some questions in the chat um barry asked has anything at all not gone as planned oh boy that's a good question um the answer is almost nothing almost nothing this has been such a perfect deployment um, it's hard put to find anything that didn't work according to plans. I think there was one thing that I remember reading that there was one motor that had overheated a little bit and it, it was hotter than what they were expecting it to be, but it was not a breaking point. And let me share with you that on this web telescope, the, the people who made it counted 344 points of single points of failure, which means that if one of those little motors or cables or you know pulleys that was involved in unfolding the, the, the sun shield and the mirror, if one of them did not work, there was no backup for it. There was no way that anything could have happened. The whole thing would, would have failed right there before it even started. So it is absolutely an amazing wonder of engineering that they were able to do this. Not only was everything perfect, but actually in, in some ways it was better than perfect because it turns out that the Arian rocket did such a good job in creating the right trajectory for the rocket so that it lands up in the proper place that they did not need to use some of the fuel that they would have used in order to do a course correction. That extra fuel might be able to give about five years of extra life to the James Webb Telescope. And so it, it is a brilliant piece that has happened. Go ahead. That's that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, so that kind of answers uh, or goes on to another question that just got asked from Rusty, uh, asking, is there a sense of how long web will continue to function? Yes, that's a very good question. So the web was actually guaranteed five years of operation but it was hoped that it would be able to work for 10 years. They, you know, they generally had enough fuel that they thought that they would be able to generate 10 years. Because of how well everything has worked, there are people that are now thinking that it will be able to last for 15 years. And there was one person that I heard even mention 20 years, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, that would be a huge thing if that truly happened. But People are kind of optimistic right now that they'll be able to keep getting information and data from the web for maybe as, as long as 15 to 20 years. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a question from Greg uh, saying, how do scientists share the web telescope? And Steve asked kind of a question that was similar to that. Yes. And can you explain how the telescope time will be divided who gets mm -hmm. the use? Mm -hmm. um, that's a tough, uh, it's a tough operation, but it's very well planned. Um, so there is an organization, I don't know exactly what the names of these organizations are, um, but there's an organization that fields all the requests that come for time. All of these requests are examined very thoroughly and many, many pieces of information go into deciding who gets to have time. I'm sure you know your stature also probably makes a difference, but by and large, they figure out uh, how much value for time might be created, which is of course not a science. You just have to make the judgment call on that. There is one other criteria which I thought was very interesting. They want to minimize the amount of times that the web telescope will have to be steered in directions that are far from where it currently might be. And that is because a little bit of fuel is used for that steering. And so if we can minimize the amount of steering, 
then you can give extra life to the telescope. Um, the first year of the Webb telescope is already completely booked. There's nothing available. <laughs> of course, if some amazing thing happens, they will change that schedule. For example, if a comet happens to pass through our solar system from the galaxy and uh, they want uh, you know, every telescope to look at it, uh, the web will have certainly you know, oblige to something like that. But otherwise, uh, the first year is all called for. Uh, but it, it's a very detailed process and you know, they, they probably leave little margins and rooms in the middle just in case something may not work exactly planned, but it, it's very well organized. Great. Sounds a little more complicated than just a Google sign-up sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. By the way, um, anybody can apply for time. There are no restrictions. In fact, uh, I, I believe that 10% of the time in the first year is allocated. Well, maybe not that. 10% of the, of the applications for time came from graduate students. And, and they are as seriously looked at as anybody else. That's great. Um, and I had a quick question during the talk, um, just does the discrepancy in calculating the age of the universe depend on which wavelength is used? So I know you said that they calculated that with microwaves. Um, will yes, that change yes. optically with infrared? Oh, that's an interesting question. So the microwave radiation is one way to calculate the age because the microwave radiation essentially gives you this baby picture of the universe, the one that we call cosmic um, background radiation. And what you do is you're not looking at the radiation itself. You're looking at the features that you see in the picture that is created from that radiation. And those features and the sizes of those features allow you to say exactly what the rate of expansion was at that time. And then you can use all the physics that we know, which is actually called the standard model of cosmology which can use data like the amount of dark energy, the amount of dark matter, and the amount of ordinary matter in the universe, along with the size of these features, all of that information plugged into physical equations, and it tells you exactly how fast the universe would be expanding today and how long it has been expanding. Now, the other piece of information is not infrared. It is simply looking at the speeds of the galaxies and how far fast they're receding. It turns out that the further a galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. And so if you can look at the distance and the speed, you can basically take the ratio of those two and that tells you the expansion rate. So both of these things are not related to the radiation. They're actually re late, related to what features the radiation is able to tell you. Okay, I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that helps a lot, so it's more of a resolution issue. It's more of a resolution issue, you got it, exactly. Perfect, right. Okay, um, well, let's see, moving on. I, I saw a hand up, I think Lisa Verney had her hand up for a question. Great, Lisa, she's one of my friends. Well, this may be a basic question, but when you showed the video at the very beginning and the unfolding each day or days, you know, what, what happened on each day, I had a question of, did it take that long or do, does it require the pace in order for stability of some sort, like not to go so fast? You know, it, mm -hmm. it, there's a process. It's not all at yes. once. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does require time. You can't do this very quickly. Um, part of it is because every motion is done very slowly. Um, you don't want to create a jerk or, you know, shake the equipment that could, you know, make something not work later on. So it has to be done very slowly. Um, and interestingly, you know, they had a very well-defined process in terms of when each thing would be done. And they always have gaps in between in case something doesn't work, you know, you'll be able to do that. Things were working so well that the, during the first week after the launch, that on New Year's Day, which was supposed to be a work day for them, they took a day off. They said everything was working so well, they didn't need to do anything on New Year's Day, and everybody partied. <laughs> so yes, it has to be done slowly, but there are margins that are built in. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, continue in the chat here. Um, uh, a question from Steve. 
since it is infrared, will the pictures not look like what we are used to with the Hubble telescope images? Will Excellent. images be photoshopped? Excellent question. Um, so yes, um, the answer is yes, but Photoshop to a degree. Um, infrared is not something that our eyes can see. So we don't have any way to, dis to, uh, dis to distinguish a color in the infrared radiation. So what happens is that artificial colors are added so if the infrared is longer, then you know it, be, it might become a little bit reddish. If it's shorter, it might be considered to be bluish. So those colors are added to the infrared to create a picture that we can see with our eyes. So yes, because our eyes cannot see infrared, it's really not a picture that we could have seen with our eyes, but it gives us all the information that we need in order to do the physics that we need to do with that picture. And it can be very, very beautiful to look at as well. <laughs> so. That's the answer. Great. Uh, another question, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Ashok um, asked, yep. what is the reason for Webb to orbit at L2? And another question would be, would reflected light from say Jupiter be of concern to heat up Webb? Okay, good questions. So the L2, is one of five points around the orbit of the Earth where if you put an object, it will revolve around the sun in a synchronous way, which means that it will stay at the same relative position with respect to the Earth without having to use any fuel. This is gravitational dynamics. Gravity does the job. Now, there's only one point out of those five Lagrange points where the Earth, the sun, and the moon are all in the same direction so that one sun shield can block the light and the heat basically from all three of them. In the other Lagrange points, it would be impossible or much more difficult to, to do that. And that is why it is um, L2 that we use. Now, what was the second question? I forgot. Yes, sir, me? Sorry, this is a show, Kai. Just yeah. to clarify my question. Um, my question wasn't about the overall orbit, but my yeah. understanding is while it is at L2, it's gonna have its own little orbit. Oh, so the halo orbit? I guess that's what it's called. Yeah, so the halo orbit is to prevent the uh, telescope from being in the shadow of the earth. Because if it's okay. in the shadow of the earth, then the solar cells will not work. And so you need to keep it away. So, you know, it's a, clever twist yeah. that they did in order to make that happen. Does that answer all your questions? That first one, yeah. And the second one had to do about reflected light from Jupiter. Is that a concern? Oh, yeah. Can yeah, that's right. Um, it, no, it is not just because Jupiter is far enough away. Um, so if you look at the distances that are involved, you know, this is only a million miles from uh, the Earth, but it's actually uh, of the order of... Uh, maybe almost a billion or half a billion miles from, from Jupiter. So the relative distance is so huge that even the fact that the Jupiter happens to be a pretty big planet, the actual amount of infrared radiation coming from Jupiter is negligible. So you don't have to worry about it. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, a question from Dan. Are there any cosmologists who are willing to draw a sketch of the surprises that will be seen in the early formation of the stars and galaxies? Or is it just completely unknown by all until the first images are provided by JWST? <laughs> there are always theories. <laughs> you know, scientists can never sit tight and just wait for answers to come. So um, there are many theories of how the early galaxies and stars are forming, what they might look like, what the super supermassive black holes might be doing. Uh, so yes, so you can take one of those theories and you can ask an artist to sketch what that would look like. Um, but the real answer will come when we see the pictures and not just the pictures, also the spectrographs uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the web because the spectrographs tell you the composition of uh, the material that is in those galaxies, that is in those stars. So we'd, we would be able to figure out what's actually happening in terms of um, the physics that's behind it. So yes, you can, artists can certainly draw pictures, um, but the real one, nobody can know until we find out. 
Great. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question from Cliff kind of picking backing off of what we were talking about earlier. Um, is it possible that the discrepancy is due to the standard model not being quite right? As far as absolutely, these, absolutely. And so this particular mystery is being viewed as a test of the standard model. There is a possibility that the measurements that were made were had some issues and problems with them, but the measurements have been made very, very accurately. And um, you know, part of the problem is that sometimes the light from one of these supernovas that you look at might be uh, dimmed by some dust in the middle, and that could create a little bit of inaccuracy. But most of the physicists right now think that the problem is deeper than that, and that it may be that there is another source of anti-gravity. So what it is is that the rate of expansion that you get by looking at the galaxies um, is a little bit faster than the rate of expansion that you get by looking at cosmic background radiation. So it seems that perhaps somewhere in the middle, there was another source like dark energy. So it could be another form of dark energy. It could be another version of dark energy um, that could have created that extra acceleration to make the expansion rate faster. If that was true, that would not that would completely uh, modify our standard model. Uh, it's possible that we don't understand the nature of dark energy well enough, and that dark energy may be doing in interesting things in the middle that are causing this extra acceleration to happen. So that would be um, you know something that we would get to know about dark energy if that happened. So many possibilities exist. It, it could even be because there are extra particles in the universe that we don't know about because expansion rate is very sensitive to the density of matter. And if there were some particles like neutrinos, for example, that are very difficult to detect and that are in our universe, they could be giving us some of that extra thing that we're talking about. So many possibilities, nobody knows the answer, um, but yes, it it could very well mean that something is wrong with our standard model, which by the way, is the most exciting result because um, you know we want to continue to improve that standard model and this might be a way to do it. Yeah, that would be very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Um, moving on to Phil uh, asked, what might we hope to learn about black holes with the web? Ah, yeah, a lot actually. Um, so first of all, the supermassive black holes that uh, were created very early in the universe, it looks like, and were, played a cru crucial role in the formation of galaxies, uh, we will be able to see what kind of a effect are those black holes having on the surroundings? What role are they playing in, in bringing gas together in order to form galaxies? Uh, how many collisions are taking place in, in, amongst those black holes. So that's one part. But even beyond that, some of the black holes that exist in our galaxies are often not uh, clearly enough visible in the light that we look at them. In fact, visible light is not a very good light to look at black holes because they don't give out any light. Uh, by looking at infrared, we will get information about those black holes that is not available on other uh, wavelengths. And so our knowledge about black holes, which there is still a lot to, to gather in that room, uh, will increase as a result of, um, of, of this as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, our next question is from Nancy. Can you mm -hmm. speak about how communication is accomplished from ground control from Earth? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, so communication is, of course, vital. Without communication, we will have nothing at all uh, from the web telescope. So we are in constant radio communication with the web. It has an antenna. In fact, the antenna is on the other side of the shield, the one that is exposed to the sun because heat doesn't matter for the antenna. Um, that antenna is constantly radiating information back to the Earth, and Earth is sending commands to, to the web telescope. Um, <clears throat> It takes only a few seconds. Uh, light from the moon takes one and a half seconds to, to come to the earth. And so this is about four times as far away as the moon is from the earth. So that would be about six seconds to go and six seconds to come back. So within 12 seconds, you can essentially 
have a back and forth communication with the satellite. All of the images are broken up into digital data and that data is transmitted back to the earth and it's reintegrated by our computers into these beautiful images that you will be able to see hopefully uh, at some point in time. Um, all of that stuff can be done in a, in a couple of hours. So, you know, scientists that are eagerly sitting on their computers to see what, what they can see, will be able to see an image a couple of hours after the web telescope has gotten the data to, to, to uh, make it happen. That's pretty darn fast. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, next question is from Good. Can we get a better view of our own planets using the JWT? Yes, that was one of the parts that I missed out on because there was so much to cover. Uh, actually, the Webb telescope will be spending a fair amount of its time looking at our own solar system. Um, there are many mysteries about our own solar system. Um, there is a lot of uh, emissions that our planets have in the infrared which can give us more details about the atmospheres of our own planets. They can also tell us more about the composition of the surfaces of our planets. For example, recently we found some gases in Venus that we think on Venus that we think could also be indicators of life there, you know, prime microbial life. Um, the Webb telescope can look at those things in much more detail and find out exactly where some of those gases might be that could support um, microbial life possibly. Um, we might also try and look for planet X. Planet X is the ninth planet, which people think exists, but they're not sure because it is deeply hidden inside what's called the Kuiper belt. Um, the Webb telescope will study uh, objects in the Kuiper belt and look for uh, these, um, these you know, mysterious planets as well. So yes, there is a lot that the Webb will do with our own, within our own solar system too. Massively exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. We're going to take three more questions. We're going to hear from Rusty, Steve, and then we'll end with uh, Marianne's question. So okay. the question from Rusty is, is NASA or others providing ongoing funding for researchers using the web? The answer to that question is yes, they are. Uh, web has now reached a point of maturation that it would not make sense to take funding away from it. Um, um, however, uh, at one time, Webb was called the uh, astronomy eater or some, you know, some word like that because it was taking money away from other uh, NASA projects in order to support it. So some people were not very happy. Uh, also, the history of uh, Webb is a little bit checkered. Um, it turned out that it was way, way above its budget that, that was initially planned for and way more in terms of the time that it took to build it. it. It now, the total amount of money that was spent on web is now about $10 billion. So there was a point around 2010, 2011, when uh, Congress took money away from uh, the, the building of the web. And it took a huge amount of lobbying, some of it international lobbying, uh, for the Senate to uh, then finally overwrite uh, the congressional, uh, you know, legislation and the money was restored. So yes, there is always an issue with budget with these things, but at this point, I think people are not gonna touch web because it is such an important instrument. Okay, next. Steve. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, teaching us all that. Just have a quick question about the Lagrange point. Like how big of a space is that L2? And does the uh, telescope ever, will it ever need to be like steered? I mean, do they, it, does it drift off so that you do have to correct it at some point? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, um, it turns out that some Lagrange points are quote unquote stable and other Lagrange points are not that stable. Um, and so L2 unfortunately is not one of the stable Lagrange points. So if you put something at L at L2, and you know, within a few hundred miles, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. That's kind of the, the big how big that area is. But over time, it will tend to drift. 
And this is why you need a little bit of fuel in, in L2 to make sure that it doesn't drift too far from that point. Um, so, so yes, there is an issue with stability and that is uh, something that, you know, a little bit of fuel has been put aside in order to take care of. But by and large, it will stay in that area, parked in that area for all of the time that it's going to be operational. And it's very critical that it be able to do that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. the last question, which I think is a very fitting way to end the, the talk <laughs> is, what is the question that holds the most curiosity for you? What possibility Ooh. has you most excited to discover? That's a good question. <laughs> I'll answer it a little, little artfully. <laughs> so one of the things about telescopes is that there are often, quite often actually, things that telescopes discover that nobody has asked the question about. Um, Hubble, for example, almost half the discoveries of Hubble were not answers to questions that were there when the Hubble was built. They simply popped up. For example, the acceleration of the universe, nobody ever suspected that the universe expansion would be accelerating, but it just came out and surprised everybody from left field. So the way I look at it, um, these instruments that we humans are, are able amazingly to create and to use are not only to answer the questions that we have, but they are also there to create new questions that no one has ever thought about. And what I would love to see personally is Webb Telescope making us face to face with something that nobody had ever thought about that was in no one's drawing board and it it raises a huge new thing that you know nobody had ever suspected. That's what I'm hoping. That's kind of the best possible thing that could happen. But there are lots and lots of other things that um, I would absolutely love to get answers for. Um, certainly finding out more about the beginning of the universe is, is one of them. To me, um, figuring out how the first stars were created is almost like trying to figure, figure out how the first living cells were created which eventually led to the evolution and you know to human beings. We know a lot about how stars eventually created planets and planets created life, but we don't know very much about how these first stars were created and, and where exactly they happened, how, how, what their distribution was, what their mass was. We have no idea about that. And to be able to figure that out would be a big deal. So thank you everybody for hanging in there despite the Super Bowl going on. Thank you very much for um, coming to this talk. Thank you for your answers. This was a wonderful <laughs> Q&A session. Yeah, and it was very, awesome. very, very nice. And thank you for hanging in beyond the time also. Thank you. Thank you so much for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the opportunity. Yes, yes. And if anybody has other questions, uh, Steve has my email address. You're very, very welcome to send me an email and I'll be more than happy to try and answer them for you. Great. And if you want to get that information, you can go back to our meetup page, send us messages through the meetup page, and we'll be happy to relay that information to you. Um, as well as I'm going to link, this is also on the meetup page, but I'll link to our YouTube channel in the chat. So you can go there and this talk will be uh, uploaded there shortly. So you can go ahead and share it with all your friends and revisit it and uh, look back on all this stuff. So, um, and this is also be posted on the meetup page. So as always, you can find all the information there. So just want to say thank you again. Great. Thank you. Jill. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Happy oh, Super Bowl. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. It was wonderful. Superb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I sneak in a question? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm still around. <laughs> Thank you. This is, this is Joe Cran. Thank you very much. Yes, Do Joe. they think they'd be able to take uh, detect Hawking's radiation around the black hole? No, Hawking's radiation is not in infrared, unfortunately. So uh, there is not much hope for that. And in fact, we don't even know that such radiation exists right now. Uh, we only know that if there were small black holes, 
that they would be radiating, but we don't know whether there are such black holes at all. So um, that is not one of the aims of the of the telescope. I, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for sneaking yeah. in this question. No, 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 not this I want to sneak in a comment, if I may. Yes, Ashok. Hey, Sarpik, this is Ashok, your former colleague from New Jersey yeah, yeah. calling. Yes, I, I managed to get in. Thank you for letting me know this is going on. Uh, for folks pleasure. on the bridge, uh, Sarpik and I were colleagues at uh, Bell Labs and uh, Lucent. Uh, the only thing I want to add is fantastic talk. Thank you very much. And my wife wants me to tell you that she's got, you've got her hooked into uh, astronomy now. So now we have two oh, in so the house. she was listening in too. Yes, she was. <laughs> Without <laughs> any permission, but she did. <laughs> okay. My Thank wife you, is listening in as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great. Jill, yeah. will you tell us about uh, next month's talk too? I want to make sure you have a chance to... Very quickly, we're going to be going from outer space to inner space. So um, you're welcome to come back and join us. We'll be talking with Jill Heinrich, who is an, an incredible cave diver and filmmaker and writer. And she's going to talk about um, scientific cave diving that she's done. And it'll be really great. You can read more about her in our meetup session uh, page, or you can just Google her. So please come back for inner space. And That's arguably, good. cave diving tells us a lot about outer space as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, thanks everybody for being here. Yeah. Yes. Thanks again, Sarmate. Take care, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Steve. Yes. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Until next time. <laughs>